Let's pray. Heavenly Father, send us your spirit and teach us your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, very good morning to you all, if we've not met yet. Uh, I'm Simon Stocks, I'm one of the ministers here at Christchurch. Um, I wonder if you've ever been to a, a gathering, uh, maybe like this afternoon's, um, family, friends, you know, people who know each other well, and you go along to it and there's a certain amount of predictability. You know how certain people are going to be. You know, Uncle Arthur will be late, because he always is, come what may. Aunt Sarah will bring a present, even though everyone, everyone's been asked not to, because she always does. Steve will disappear outside for half an hour. No one will know what he's doing, but he will come back. You know, that sort of thing. There'll be that, there'll be that you know, we know what's going to happen here. We're all different, and there's a certain amount of predictability about the way we behave. Well, that was the image that comes to mind for me when I was reading this passage, um, and I'll explain more about that as we go along. Um, we've been working our way through the book of Genesis for, for several months now, uh, and we're just about at the end. Uh, we've been thinking about what it means to be human in a God-shaped world. And we've been following the stories of the patriarchs of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. And we've reached more or less the conclusion now uh, when Jacob reaches the end of his life. And he's had these 12 sons, and he gathers them to him and gives them his words of blessing, his final words of insight as their father um, before he passes away. And we're going to ask the three questions that we've been asking throughout this series. What does this tell us about God? What does it tell us about being human? And what does it mean for us today? Did you spot God in the reading? You'd have been doing quite well if you did. Because <laughs> God's not terribly evident. God gets a couple of mentions but he's not really in the foreground. We don't learn a great deal directly about God in this passage. Rather, God is very much in the background. This is a human story, principally. This is looking back, a man looking back over his lifetime and noting the particular characteristics of his sons and some of the things that have happened in their lives that have been really significant. Um, and there's not much account of God did this, God did that, God did the other. Virtually the only mention that God gets is when um, Jacob is thinking about Joseph um, and he says Joseph remained steady uh, when other people were attacking him um, and he could do that, this is in verse 24, because of the hand of the mighty one, because of the shepherd, the rock of Israel. So God gets the credit for enabling Joseph to do what he did, but apart from that, there's hardly any evidence of God at all. So the sense that we get, therefore, is that God is in the background. God is there all the time, and that God is active and can work through situations, even if it's not evident at the time. Um, and I find that uh, quite helpful and quite encouraging, because that's pretty much how I experience life, mainly. I'm not very conscious of God's immediate activity and involvement in my life. I get up in the morning, I say my prayers, I get on with the day, I make my decisions, I do what needs doing. And I don't have a particularly strong sense of sort of God intervening at any point. And that seems to be what's happening here. But the point is that God is transcending all of that. God is there. God can work through any circumstance. God can bring good out of any situation. 
And we might not see it at the time, but it can become evident later. And certainly that's the case in the story of Joseph. And you may remember that there's a very well-known phrase when at the end of jo- the story of Joseph having been sold into slavery and suffered terrible things and then become the assistant of Pharaoh and saved a whole country from famine and he's eventually reconciled to his brothers who are the ones who sold him as a slave and he says to them you intended this for harm but God meant it for good and there's that sense in which there's a very nitty gritty down to earth human story of people getting on with their lives and of God transcending it all not necessarily intervening but just being there, nudging, having an influence in subtle ways and bringing good out of all that went on. But in a way which is only really evident in hindsight. So we only learn something quite subtle and quite indirect about God in this story because it does seem to be focused very much on the human people but always with the understanding that God is there, God is in the background. God is in the wings, as it were. God is on the sound desk, perhaps. (laughs) He's not playing the instruments, but he does have a bearing on what you hear. You can make your own analogy. I didn't just say that you were divine, by the way. Don't get (laughs) overexcited. What does this tell us about being human? It tells us quite a lot, actually. The thing that struck me the most was how different these 12 sons are. And what Jacob is doing in blessing them is drawing out their different characteristics. Um, Issachar is going to be a seafarer. Um, No, he's not. He's a scrawny donkey. (laughs) Well, there you go. How different can you get? Zebulun is going to live by the seashore and become a haven for ships. Issachar is a scrawny donkey. Okay, Um, Dan is going to judge people, Gad will be a raider, and Asher will be, uh, his food will be rich and will provide delicacies. These are very different images, different types of people, aren't they? One of them's a chef, one of them's a warrior, one of them's a seagoer, and one of them is an arbitrator. So, very different people with different characteristics. And... In blessing them, Jacob is drawing out those differences. He's noticing the particular skills and aptitudes that they have. He also wants to highlight that in the way they live out those aptitudes, in the way they live their lives, there will be consequences for their actions. And that was particularly evident in the first three, Reuben, Simeon, and Levi who are castigated for their earlier behaviour. And the reference is back to stories that have happened a few chapters earlier on in in the story of Genesis. So Reuben, uh, at one point, slept with one of his father's concubines, um, for which he is uh, is, um, told that he will no longer excel, he will no longer be honourable. And um, Simeon and Levi, when their sister Dinah was abused and raped, They avenged that in a completely over-the-top and grossly violent way. And they are cursed for their gross anger and their fierce cruelty. So what that says to me is that whilst we go about making our decisions and living our lives with God in the background, there are consequences to the way we live. What we do has an effect on others and on ourselves. Now, God can, work, God can deal with that. We know that God can bring good out of evil, uh, and we know that God can forgive. We've already made our confession and reminded ourselves of God's forgiveness this morning. But there are consequences. What we do does not happen uh, aside from other people. And this reminds us of that. And the third thing that this story, this account tells us about being human um, is the reality of family life, (laughs) which is not great. This is a pretty dysfunctional family. 
We have to be frank about that, bearing in mind that the whole family history has been characterized by Jacob picking out one of his 12 sons and showing intense favoritism to that son, who was Joseph, as a result of which the other 11 sons hated him and sold him as a slave. Um, And he went off and suffered terrible injustice, but then ended up saving the whole family from famine in the end. And the favoritism hasn't gone away. (laughs) You think Jacob might have learnt a lesson. You think he might have said, you know, oh dear, that was a bit foolish of me. But no, he's still got his favourites, and he's got two favourites now. Um, If you go back and look at the passage, you'll see that Judah and Joseph both get much more attention and a much more favourable blessing than any of the other ten. So even now, after all that, Jacob has still got his favourites. Family dysfunctions do not generally go away. Um, we could have a show of hands now and say, put, up, if, put your hand up if, you, if your family is dysfunctional. And we won't do that. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure there'd be quite a good show of hands. But this is the reality of life. These are the patriarchs, these are the ancestors of God's people. This is the story of how God's people began, and it's a really dysfunctional family. Now, I hope that we can just about find something encouraging there. I mean, at the very least, it means that if we live in a dysfunctional family, it doesn't mean that something's gone horribly, horribly wrong, and it doesn't mean that we cannot be godly people. Rather, we are walking in the footsteps of our ancestors in faith. God does not spare us from things going wrong in our families. But still, God can work through that, and God can transcend it, and God can bring good out of it. There's this strange interplay between the harsh reality of the imperfections and the messiness of human life and families that we know and experience on the one hand, and on the other hand, a God who chooses us out of God's grace, God who shows us kindness, God who reaches out to us in love and makes it possible for us to know all the blessings of God's goodness. And yet doesn't kind of take away that messiness and that dysfunction, but blesses us in it and through it. So the question for me, in the midst of my own family mess, is not so much, God, why won't you stop this? But God, where are you in this? God, what can you do through this? And is there anything I need to know that's going to help that to happen and not get in the way? I don't expect to be suddenly, miraculously delivered and lifted out of the messiness of human life. But I am concerned to get just enough of a glimpse of what God might be doing just to make sure that I don't make it any worse. Make sure that I'm not part of the problem, as it were. Well, I probably am. (laughs) Any more than, 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 than I can avoid being. So there's a real reality here about the messiness of human life and family dysfunction. Um, my, the, my friend Richard Briggs, who um, recently wrote a, a little book about this story of Genesis, uh, he's got a lovely analogy, which is wonderful. Um, the, the, the world of, of ancient Israel is part of what's commonly referred to as the ancient Near East. The ancient Near East. And he describes the story of Jacob and his family as being rather like ancient Near Eastenders. Because <laughs> they're always arguing and fighting and messing it up, and it's a terribly dramatic and down-to-earth story. And this is the story of the origin of God's people. This is the story that we have inherited. And, uh, you know, we could draw out other things along the way. We could think of the disciples of Jesus arguing amongst themselves about who's going to be the greatest. And so, you know, so it goes on. 
So what does it mean for us today? Well, I think I want to encourage us by saying God is there. God is in the background, even when we can't see exactly what God is doing. And God can bring good out of any situation. We are involved in writing the story of our own lives. A story will one day be told of our lives, and it's a story which we, day by day now, are writing. What do you want your story to be? Write it well. And what do you want people to say about you? What will they be saying about you this afternoon in the Philippi room? (laughs) Will they expect you to turn up late, because you always do? Or to bring a present, even though you've been asked not to? I noticed we weren't asked not to bring presents. I'll take that as a hint. (laughs) Will you disappear for half an hour and then come back when you feel sane again? Because that's what you always do. Well, what is it that you want, do you think people notice about you? And I think there is something positive there, not just saying, you know, let's try and avoid being the person everyone talks about, but there's something positive about knowing who you are, knowing the person God made you, knowing your unique characteristics. Are you a a seafarer or a musician or a chef or an arbitrator? What sort of person has God made you? And just as the blessing of Jacob involved drawing out and highlighting the particular characteristics of each of his 12 sons, maybe there's a blessing for each of us in really knowing and embracing who we are as an individual, the sort of person God has made us, and living our lives in the way that makes the best of that and contributes the best to our family, the family of God's people. I hope that encourages you. Amen.